In this video, we're going to go through the VF1, VFO from top to bottom, taking a basket case unit that was discarded in a garage, didn't even have a real front panel, had it something homemade, and we're going to bring it up to snuff and uh, do some testing on it and see how it performs. The VF1 uh, VFO is much maligned, much treasured, depends on who you talk to. Some guys swore by it and claimed it was the best VFO they've ever used and uh, it worked very well with all of their different novice rigs. Others took the cord, flipped it around their head like Davy and Goliath and threw it into the nearest dumpster. So to start with, uh, Heathkit uh, built a VFO around a single tube the 6AU6 in an electron coupled oscillator circuit. They did uh, take the time to put some regulation on the screen of the tube, 150 volt regulation, but the rather anemic power supply in a rig like the DX40 or uh, some of the early uh, transmitters, uh, you could get in trouble by overstressing the transmitter's power supply by hanging something like a VF1 off it. The VF1 is an electron coupled coal pits oscillator. Specifically, it's a series tuned coal pit, sometimes called a clap oscillator. Uh, the tube is uh, outfitted with 150 volts on the screen grid, which kind of acts as the plate with this oscillator. And then it's an electron coupling to the plate itself, where we have some broadband tuned circuits that tend to uh, resonate at the foundational frequencies of the VFO. And the VFO actually operates on the 160 meter band on band one, and operates on the 40 meter band on band two. And then in band three, they add a, a, a patter capacitor that drops the frequency from seven megahertz to six megahertz, so that you can use uh, multiples of six to get to the old CB band or the 11 meter band. I can tell you at its fundamental frequencies, it can generate up to 50 volts RMS on frequency. 50 volts. So you're operating on harmonics most of the time. You should get several volts out on the harmonic frequencies with an uh, oscillator that is this powerful. That fairly high voltage is generated across a 47K resistor. When you plug it into the crystal socket in, in the transmitter, it will drop even further because it usually has an impedance that's similar. So you should be able to get several volts of drive out of this VFO. My modified circuit, I actually uh, took the advice that I saw online of lowering the screen grid voltage from 150 volts to 105 volts. And I also added the two 0.01 bypass capacitors on the uh, filament and the high voltage. And I uh, figured out how to pad down band 3 so that it could be useful in some of the WARC bands, such as 30 meters, uh, eight, uh, 17 meters, and uh, 12 meters. So that allows you to pick one of those bands for that odd band 3, and you'll be able to use it on uh, some of the WARC bands. It's going to need a little bit of cleanup. And what happened to the front panel? This is a homebrew front panel. Wow, I don't even know how you would make this. But somebody did it. That's cut by hand. This is going to be quite a job to get this one back. So I'm looking at the uh, the VF1 manual and I'm looking at the front of this and I see there's a toggle switch rather than the three position off standby on. So we got to figure out what's going on there. So a lot of mysteries with this set. I have no idea why these things were bent the way they were so that the window was far lower than it should have been. I took those uh, copper sides off, you know, that they had tacked on here. I took those off. wanted to try to test it as stock as possible. Okay, we've got it somewhat lined up now. And 
uh, the, uh, the brackets are at more of a right angle. So you might wonder how the uh, VFO is actually powered by the DX40. The DX40 has about a 550 volt power supply. So what they do is they have a 15K resistor that uh, goes between the 550 and the accessory socket. And when you put about 20 or 25 mils through a 15K resistor, you get enough voltage drop that it brings it down to uh, between 230 and 250 volts. So theoretically, um, there's 250 volts that uh, appears on the VFO. The problem is when the tube's not lit up, most of that voltage does arrive. So uh, the next step is to try to calibrate the, uh, the VFO. And we'll do a rough calibration with the VFO outside its chassis. But uh, of course we want to know if it works at all. Um, I've got the output of the VFO which comes out this uh, coax to the uh, crystal holder going into a crystal socket and then right into the counter. Uh, you also notice I have a high voltage power supply. I have the series 15K or effectively 15K of resistance uh, going into a octal socket that's delivering the, the high voltage to the VF1. And I'm actually lighting up the VF1's filament with a power supply, just to take that out of the equation for now. I'm not going to use the power supply or AC on the uh, filament. I'm going to actually light it with 6 volts DC. Um, on the uh, initial hookup, we're also using a key that's going into the jack in the back. And that key is going to be how we're going to be... Uh, Keying the oscillator. You can also see I've got some capped on tape here and there to kind of uh, remind me that there's high voltage here and that uh, um, not that the capped on tape is going to completely protect me, but it's, it's going to constantly remind me that I have high voltage exposed. I can tell you that I had a real problem figuring out how to do the calibration using the, uh, the assembly instructions. Um, it's a strange dial mechanism and a uh, kind of a, uh, a complex tuning capacitor that's inside. Uh, the capacitor is kind of like a butterfly capacitor in that it has uh, different sections. And uh, I finally got a hold of this nice note uh, written by Bob Eckweiler. And uh, this is an interesting excerpt I downloaded from the internet that gave me some of the, uh, the hidden steps that you need to get that dial set right on the VF1. Turns out this is a, a trickier operation than they lead you to believe in the manual. So when you see this dial that has, you know, 1750, 3500, and 7000 on it, you figure, oh great, just set that for 7000 and then put it in the, uh, you know, in, in the second position and tune it up for 7000. Well, that's not the way it works. Instead, we find that the VFO actually tunes on range 1, this is range 1 over here, from 1750 to 2000. Okay, 1.75 megahertz to 2 megahertz. So that's the actual tuning on that first band. Is it used in other bands? Yes, it can be used on 160, 80, or 40 meters. But you're not tuning for 7 megahertz, you're tuning for 1750. Then when you want to go to range 2 is when you tune it for the 7 to 7.3 or 7.425 megahertz and the dial is in a completely different position for that and you'll have it in band 2. So I did not understand that.
So we're going to start with the 1750 to 2 megahertz, or 1750 to 2000 kilohertz. So that's band 1. And we're setting it for 1750. And we're going to key it up. And up on the counter we can see we have 1735. We're not very far off. Okay, so we want to bring that to 1750 and we're going to do that with the coil. So I turn the coil counterclockwise. It's going to start going up until we hit 1750. I'm just going to leave it there for now. And then we turn back. To 2000. Ooh. Oh yeah. Okay. So we've got it. So rough calibration is set. So now just cinch that set nut down. Okay. So we will set that. Okay, there's 2,000, and we're going down. Seventeen fifty looks pretty good. Okay, so rough calibration on band one is complete. So I failed to mention that uh, this is the original tube that was with it, six AU six, and the original. Uh, OA2 150 volt regulator tube. Nothing has been substituted at this point. It's the original parts. I will go in and check to see if we actually have the 150 volts of regulation on the screen and we'll actually listen to the note and see how it keys and see if it's uh, if it has chirp and so on. Okay so now we want to calibrate BN2 and we know that BN2 is going to be 7 megahertz to 7.425 so how do we get to band 2 to calibrate it? So we're still looking at 1750 up there. So we're going to switch over here to band 2. And it says 7091. And if I tune, Look, the frequency is going down as I turn to the right. Oh my god, there must be something wrong with this VCO. As I turn to the right, as I turn to the right and go up in frequency, the counter is actually going down. What's wrong? Well, what's wrong is I'm in the completely wrong part of the dial. I have to go all the way around until I get back to this point which is, I don't know if you can see it, 7, 14, 21, and 28. So just by turning the dial all the way around, I'm in the separate section of that variable. And now I'm ready to calibrate the upper band. And it says it's at 6661, so it's got to go up in frequency. So again, we'll start with the coil and then adjust with the capacitor. Now when you're adjusting the uh, trimmer on top, it's best to use a, a tool like this that's not uh, metallic because it will influence the trimmer, especially at the higher band. Let's start with the trimmer at about 8 o'clock. As you can see, the trimmer is set for about 8 o'clock. And the coil is out at about uh, half inch. And uh, I adjusted the trimmer so it's close to 7 to start with. Okay, so that's adjusted around 7. Let's bring it up slowly. Okay, there's 7.3. Ooh, that's pretty close. 7310. Anyway, I'm satisfied that we've got a rough calibration done on this on both bands. Now when you go to this third band all it does is it puts another capacitor in parallel. You turn the dial all the way up to you see the 27 that's the 11 meter band. It's the old CB band. So to get to the CB band you're using 6 megahertz and multiplying it up. 
for instance, uh, 6.75 times 4 would be 27 megahertz. So that's what this upper range is for. So if we instead make the uh, VFO tune uh, from 6 megahertz, or just under 6 megahertz, to about 6.5 megahertz, that handles both the 17 and the 12 meter band, multiplying by 3 in the case of the 17 meter band, multiplying by 4 in the case of the 12 meter band. So I put in a 27 picofarad um, fixed capacitor across it. Let's see if we can hit 6. Ta da! We hit it. Megahertz when it's reading 7 on the dial. Okay, so then we're going up. And now we're at the very top of the dial, and we hit 6226. So something we haven't done yet is uh, check to see how the regulator works. Right now it's showing 148 volts, and we're going to key it. No sign of chirp. At 3.5 megahertz. So here's the disturbing part. Uh, key up, we got 344 volts coming into this thing. When we go key down, 301 volts. So with the requisite uh, 15K dropping, it isn't 250, it's more like 300 volts. Okay, the next step is to peak the output. There's uh, two coils that need to be adjusted. The first one is for the low range and uh, you, you go to the middle of the range I've got it set for 3700 I've got an RMS voltmeter hooked right up to the the output and then you just peak the, uh, the coil on top okay in band 2 we're going to be adjusting the bottom coil and again we want to go to the middle of the range I had to go to a lower range on the meter as well Now after we've uh, performed this uh, operation, it might have pulled the frequency off. So let's turn it on, key it up, let's go down, let's go down to 1750, we have to go with the other band. It's pretty close actually. Pretty darn close. Again, good enough for the rough calibration. So I can say with the uh, OB2 regulator tube that as you key it, it does not extinguish as much as it does uh, when you're using the, uh, the 150 volt tube. It's running much cooler to the touch. And now on some of the tubes they're very stable but they don't key very well. Listen to this one. So this one seems to not like the initial. So I'm using the uh, the OB2 for 105 volt regulation and a special type of 6AU6 called a 6AU6 WA Whiskey Alpha. The WA is a, uh, a special high frequency uh, ruggedized tube. It's a selected tube. It's, uh, it's putting out uh, over 25 volts RMS. This uh, lower voltage regulator, and I'm using a 22K 5 watt to feed the, uh, the regulator tube instead of the 15K that's usually in there. The regulator tube is, is just warm to the touch. It's not hot like the other one was. And as you key, you can see that the, the light on the tube doesn't radically go down like it was on the other one. And also, I can now put my hand on the 6AU6 and not get burned. Uh, it's running cooler with that lower voltage on the screen. 
you might be asking, why am I doing all of this testing outside of the case? What I'm trying to do is eliminate all of the effects associated with the coil and capacitors, coils and capacitors. I'm just trying to characterize the tube characteristics, and that's best done with it out of the case. Once we put it in the case, now of course we're going to get heating inside the case and we're going to get I drift. Did. I went a little crazy with the tubes. I wanted to uh, check out the rumors that uh, you know certain tubes make the VF1 chirp, certain tubes give you more output. a bunch of tubes with the tube tester and I found some deliberately low 6AU6s. I also tried some tubes you might not think of uh, like the 6AK6. The 6AK6 is a miniature power pentode. The particular 6AK6 chirps like a bird, but this other one that I have sounds pretty good. So I suppose you could select one that would sound okay. One thing about the 6AK6, it really puts out the juice. I see 45 volts RMS. 45 volts RMS at 1.7 megahertz. So another tube that's interesting, it's, it's actually a 6AU6, but it's a 6AU6 Whiskey Alpha. 6AU6WA, which is a selected, high-frequency, uh, ruggedized 6AU6. Keys beautifully, and we're putting out 24 volts RMS. So certainly the uh, 6AU6, if you select well, the 6AU6A, if you select well, and uh, what about our friend the 6BA6? The 6BA6 or the EF93, very common tube used in v VCOs and VFOs. That's a 6BA6. Putting out 35, 35 volts RMS at 1.7 megahertz. So as far as uh, drive level goes, this thing seems to have a lot of output. I'm on band 2 which is the 7 megahertz uh, band and uh, you can see um, with the scope in the 5 volt per division uh, we've got many many volts. I'm going all the way up to 14.2 that would be you know, 7.1, uh, 14.3, 7.2, 7.3, 7.4, 7.5 we still have quite a bit so I've kind of biased the uh, the tuning toward the bottom of the band. Might want to touch that up and, and center it in the range, maybe at around 14.1, 14.2. Now when we get up here to the uh, compromise band, which is where we want to go to the 17 or, or 12 meter band, we're going up up here um, it isn't really peaked there. So that's the uh, the one volt per division scale. So we're only getting two or three volts RMS up at the up at these bands. So in order to improve that you'd have to go in there and uh, uh, work on that uh, tune circuit to to help that band. So, so I go to put it in the case and uh, <laughs> Turns out that the two little terminal strips that I uh, added in the back to uh, pick up the coax and the uh, power connector are actually used. Uh, they're used to uh, attach the, uh, the case to the chassis with two self-tapping metal screws. I know you guys love self-tapping metal screws. So I'm going to have to uh, take it out of the case and uh, move those terminal strips over and probably use some flathead hardware. Uh, little boo-boo. So this is not what you generally want to do. Drilling holes is no fun in this stuff, but... Uh... So we have success. Now we can see the, the holes are lining up and the uh, case was able to go totally... the chassis was able to go totally into the case. So I noticed that this switch was turning pretty hard compared to the other one. 
So actually it's a uh, pretty sturdy switch and it has two of these ball bearings. What I did is I put a screwdriver in there and removed one of the ball bearings and now the switch is much easier to turn. They're at least a lot closer. So some of you would be a little bit surprised. There was uh, an outlandish comment made that uh, you could actually use the VF1 as a transmitter on the air. So I've put together a station based on the, uh, the HR10 and simply the VF1 as my station transmitter. Now, the VF1 does not put out a lot of power. It puts out volts. So when you have uh, something like uh, 25 or 30 volts RMS across a 47K resistor, what does that translate to in real power output at 50 ohms into the antenna? That's the, the VF1 question. being a, uh, a high impedance output device, how do we transform that down to 50 ohms so that we can uh, see what kind of power it puts out? Well, you need something called a tuner, and uh, this this is a Pi match. It consists of about a seven microhenry coil, a 270 picofarad capacitor on the 50 ohm side, and a variable capacitor that's capable of uh, round uh, 20 to uh, about 600 puff on the input side, and that is going to translate the high impedance output of the VF1 into 50 ohms. So when we key, we're going to see all the power that this thing's putting out. Are you ready? Yeah, this doesn't look so good, guys. I would, you know, I would estimate that we're only talking about a few milliwatts of power, if that. So I'm not sure that this is going to be a very effective station. However, I am, I am not an unbeliever. I believe that given the right conditions and the proper antenna, that you could actually make contacts with the VF1 as your station transmitter. So I hope you've enjoyed this video on the VF1 VFO. It represented uh, the first uh, slider mechanism that many hams ever used, taking them from the rock-bound uh, simple rigs of, into the, uh, the general class. And later on, when novices were allowed to use uh, a VFO, uh, they came back into use.